As we welcome you back to the ballpark here, Danny Wachanski on the hill, the lefty for the Nighthawks. And Dan, what is his season, not necessarily any CBL, but in the spring look like? So at Pace University, he had an 071 ERA, and he was five and one in six starts and had three complete games. So definitely impressive the spring for Danny Wachanski, and he'll get his first appearance here in the NECBL. He's got a tough opponent in the first ranked offense in the NECBL, Newport, scoring just four runs in game one, but they did pick up the win behind a nice pitching performance by Tyler Madison. As I welcome in, and I'm honored to welcome in, the voice, the face, you could argue, of the Nashville Predators, Will Donick. Will, formerly a baseball player, basketball player at Vanderbilt. You've played the game a long time, drafted by the Blue Jays. You played minor league baseball for a number of years. You have a lot of experience, and, you know, it's great to have you in the booth. It's great to have you in Newport. Well, it's great to be here. I've, I've been to a number of uh, gold games over the years. My uh, father-in-law, mother-in-law, Gene and Mike Wallace, they live here. And so for the last several summers since they moved up here, we always try to catch a few goals games, so it's great to be in the booth with you. Uh, it's a beautiful day. Couldn't have picked a better one, and it's a packed crowd. As Tim Tawa digs into the right-handed batter's box, first pitch is lifted foul behind home plays. It gets into the grandstands down the left field line. It'll be Tawa, Britton, and Hosey due up here in the bottom of the first inning. Still no score, just past the 7 o'clock hour. About 75 degrees here in Newport, Rhode Island. So a lot has changed at Vanderbilt since you left. Tim Corbin was not there when you were playing as that one misses just outside. Now one ball and one strike, and they have a new field, I understand. Yes, he took over in 2003, just a year or two after they built Hawkins Field, and it's just a, it's a palace. It's a great place to play. 1-1, one, one, hit deep to left field. Midori going back at the fence, and that one is off the top of the wall. He's having trouble playing it off the carom, finally gets it in, but it is a leadoff double for Tim Tawa. What a way to start for the Stanford Cardinal. Boy, he just hammered that pitch, and you'll see it up about halfway up that big long fence that makes Cardine Field such a unique place to watch a game on a summer night. You gotta really get it up in the air to get it out of here, but he hammered that pitch. Now I understand you were a pitcher, a first baseman and an outfielder. You did a little bit of everything while you were playing at Vanderbilt, is that correct? I did a little bit of everything. I was, I was probably more a primary pitcher my first three years. In my senior year, uh, I only played baseball and I played a little bit more in the field, more of the DH. Here's Zach Britton, lefty-lefty matchup. First pitch slider taken for strike one. Now, if you were playing outfield here at Cardines, specifically center, how would you go about playing this triangle? It's got some Fenway feel to it, but you also, it juts all the way back in, something that Fenway does not have. Certainly very tough as the 0-1 curveball misses low for ball one. Well, it would certainly take some getting used to, I would think. It, it probably better for me because it's not a real big park. I didn't have <laughs> the, the biggest range uh, roaming out there, but you certainly have to know your steps. You have to get a good feel for the park. I would think this would be a tough park to come in and play as the visitor. Britton batting 429 against lefties. Not afraid of the lefty-lefty matchup. Here's the 1-1 pitch. Breaking ball. That one lined into center, and it gets just past Hardison. Rolls into center field. Tom was being waved around third. The throw is not going to be in time. It goes behind home plate, and Britton is able to advance on the throw. That will go down as a single, but an RBI one at that, and it's now one to nothing. Newport strikes first. Well, Britton did a good job there waiting on that curveball. He took it right back up the middle. And a great jump at second base. I wasn't sure they were going to send him there, especially in the situation. And a good throw might have made it close, but he got around those bases fast. And it was probably smart. They were, probably they should have cut that ball off, but he missed the cutoff. Well, that's the thing. You know, you give up free base like that, you allow Britton to just swap places. And now you have Cody Hosey, a guy who's been one of your best hitters the entire season. Due up here in the three hole as he takes a first pitch low and inside for ball one. Shadows creeping across the infield now. About a third of the way between the batter and the pitcher here. Players obviously used to it though. Here's the 1-0, that's lifted towards the backstop now. One ball and one strike. And Newport's a not, a, not a team that's very aggressive, at least when the pitcher's coming from the set. They only have eight stolen bases. They got two in game one, but they have been aggressive in situations like that. And with a team that's hitting as well as they are, leading the league in doubles, second in home runs, do you find it necessary to kind of push the limit on the base paths? 
Well, that's uh, something that gets talked about a lot in baseball circles is how, to, how aggressive to be in this day and age where really they want you to launch the ball, they want you to hit those home runs. Sometimes it's a lost art to move runners and, and steal bases, especially if the percentages aren't with you. And in this park, as we know, you can hit a lot of home runs. Absolutely. 285 down the right field line as the 2-1 is lifted deep to left field. Midori going back, looking up, and this one is gone. A two-run shot for Cody Hosey, and he gives Newport a 3 to nothing lead here in the bottom of the fourth inning. Newport not wasting any time, his fifth home run of the season, and that one was a moonshot towards the house over the left field fence, just as you said it. Well, right on cue. I guess I feel <laughs> good to spark the goals here, but Hosey really, he got right on that pitch. He launched it, and that was gone in a lot of parks. It, as we mentioned, you got to really lift the ball to get it out of of this field with the high fences, but that was well beyond the fence right here. You see it, he knows as soon as he hits it. Had a little bat flip there for a little style Oh points. yeah, oh yeah, he knows he's on camera here. Six cameras at the field as Mangrum swings and misses on the first pitch fastball. Do you think you could you bat it from the left side? Would you say you'd be able to hit it out the down the right field line, 285 with a 28 foot fence? You know, with the wood, I am not sure. At age 47, I was talking to my 12-year-old <laughs> son who loves to get out and, and swing the stick. But I would have to. I was not a home run hitter, so I, I'm not sure if I have the right swing for this part. 1-1 one, one pitch, curveball taken for strike two. But I could be pretty embarrassed if I couldn't go deep on 285. <laughs> well, you know, it's, that's, a, that's a big fence there. I mean, it's that high for a reason. There are houses right behind it as Wachanski spikes that curveball 57 feet. Now, it, it looks like Fenway used to look in the late 70s with the big screen there before they put the monster seats in there. And, and so you do have to just clear the fence and not the netting, right? The netting is already a home run, okay. yes. 2-2 two -two offering, inside out swing, ground ball towards the second baseman Hardison, scoops it up, fires it to first for out number one, but it took a lot for Upper Valley to get that one. Gonzalez now up and Fellow Commodore here. Yes. Now, did you guys, when you played, did you have the cleats that looked as good as those, the black with the gold Nike swoosh and the little gold glamour on the heel as well? No, they, they definitely have a little bling to their <laughs> uniform, and he's bringing a little gold up here to Newport. I like to see it. First pitch, fastball taken just low for ball one. Gonzalez, a newcomer here. He came late. Vanderbilt making the Super Regionals, ended up losing to Mississippi State. He's just got one hit and five at-bats so far this season. He does have an RBI, though. Looking to kind of restart this bottom of the first inning as the 1-0 is taken for ball two. But, you know, had Bowen caught that, it may have caught the outside corner. You know, Gonzalez played a lot as a true freshman for a, a very young Vanderbilt team that I think is going to have a chance to be a national contender the next couple of years because of players like him. So this will be a fun guy to watch this summer. 2-0 pitch way outside for ball three. There's also Jake Eater from Vanderbilt. He pitched in Saturday night's game against the Mystic Schooners. Five innings, two hits, no runs, and eight strikeouts. He was very sharp. Newport ended up losing the game two to nothing. As a 3-0 is just in there on the high and outside corner for strike one. But they ran into Kumar Nambiar, who now holds on to his 0.39 ERA in over 20 innings pitched from Yale. And that is not easy to do in this league. 3-1, Chase is upstairs. Now a full count here to the Vanderbilt Commodore Gonzalez. Well, he's got a lot of power, and I think that's something he's going to be working on is putting the ball in play, cutting down his strikeout rate, working on his defense. But you look at this guy in a couple years, you know, he's got the build of a guy who can play at the next level. 3-2 pitch, hit on the ground left side. Kirion can't get to it as it bounces all the way into left field. That will go down as a one-out single for Gonzalez, his second hit of the season. And Trying to restart this Newport lineup in the bottom of the first. Already three to nothing, Newport on top. Tava led off with the double, Britton with the RBI single, and Cody Hosey with the two run home run deep over the left field fence. And that's gotta be one of the best spots in the house as well. That deck there goes right up against the wall. I'm surprised that nobody's out there right now. Maybe they're at the field trying to get some free admission, donate a toy and catch the festivities here on 4th of July night as that one runs inside on Plu. And he takes his base. Well, Gonzalez hit the 3-2 changeup, just snuck it through the hole there. Pretty good pitch. And then he came back, and against the left, he just ran that one up and in. 
And as you can see, no doubter. They try to crack down sometimes at the college level, of leaning into the pitch and not making uh, any attempt to get out of there, which I kind of like. Yeah, you a, don't want them to. Pitcher, yeah, right? because, you know, you're taught to stand in, but as a pitcher, <laughs> you know, if guys are now taught to crowd the plate as much as possible, and they got all the armor, their elbows basically hanging off the inside corner as Mazza takes a first pitch curveball for strike one. Yeah, you'll see umpires from time to time. They'll stick out their finger, and they'll just say, nah, -uh, right yeah. here. You're staying right here. I wish they had that when I was pitching. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly can, you know, alter the statistics through the years <laughs> if you're going to compare them era to era. Two on, one out. Here's the 0-1 pitch. That one's taken for strike two. Mazza thought about swinging but didn't go around. It was in there regardless. That's a good breaking ball there. That was the best breaking ball he's thrown this inning. Trying to work out of it. Bates was able to do it, and he got Kirion to line into that L4 unassisted double play. As Mazza chases the 0-2 curveball in the dirt, and he is put down for out number two. First strike out of the ball game for Wachanski. So you played minor league baseball. Toronto, you played in the New York Penn League for a little bit. Is broadcasting, spe specifically hockey, is that something that you knew you wanted to do? Did it take a little bit of adjustment? Did it take missing athletics to kind of get you to stay into it? Or was that something that you knew when you were five years old? I definitely knew that I wanted to pursue something in sports. I wanted to play as long as I could, obviously. First pitch to get things is a breaking ball taken for strike one. But as you know, we all hit that spot where we're not invited back. <laughs> right. <laughs> or, or we choose to step away. <laughs> right. But uh, if we love sports, that was something I was either going to maybe want to get into coaching or get behind the mic. And I was fortunate to get some good opportunities. Oh, one pitch, another breaking ball. This one misses low for ball one. So one and one here to Jack Gethings. Playing shortstop today, usually the second baseman, but Cole Austin was a late scratch. He was originally in the lineup for game one. Mike Coombs making an adjustment, putting Plew at second, Gethings on short. And in game one, he had a single and a triple, and a run scored. Two for three evening. We're going to keep things going as the 1-1 is lifted towards the left side. Third baseman having trouble would be the left fielder, Midori, coming in and reaching up to make the catch. But Newport is able to get three runs, uh, four hits. They leave two runners on base and lead it 3 to nothing as we head to the top of the second inning right here on the NECBL Broadcast Network. As we head to the top of the second inning, Newport on top, three to nothing. It'll be Feliz, Michael, and Tarabek do up to face Josh Bates. Feliz batting from the right side, facing Bates for the first time today, and he calls timeout. Dave Peck alongside Newport goal scorekeeper Andre Olivier, the voice of the Upper Valley Nighthawks, Dan Stein, and the voice of the Nashville Predators, Will Donick. Excited to have him here in the booth. First pitch to Feliz is waved and missed for strike one. A good change up there by Bates. And he, of course, hails from Orlando, Florida. That's where I went to high school, right outside of uh, Orlando, very close to where he went to high school at Bishop Moore. Here's the 0-1 offering. It's a fastball taken low and outside for ball one. Winter Haven, I believe, doing my research. Is that, is that accurate or kind Winter of Park. there? Winter Park Winter is Park. where I went to high school. Winter Park. Uh, I have played in Winter Haven, which was a long time home. Uh, for the Boston Red Sox well, that's back what in I was, the day. That's yeah. what I was going to say. Spring training. So when Bowdoin actually goes down, a lot of teams, they're playing in the Russ Matt tournament, a lot of college teams, you go to that park, and it's very special. You know, you go in the broadcast booth, and you never know who was there as the 2-1 breaking ball misses outside for ball three. So you did play in that park. I did play in that park, yes. Uh, in fact, uh, I can remember vividly, my senior year in high school, we played against Winter Haven, got the win. Rerun pitch, fastball just missing outside, and that'll be a leadoff walk to Feliz. Now, did you play in it when it was still a minor league stadium, or was it just spring training strictly for the MLB teams? It was, uh, I remember going to see the Red Sox play at that complex when I was a kid. When I, when I first moved to Florida from up here in the Northeast, I was born in Boston, then moved to New York, and then we moved down to Florida, and that was one of the lures, at least, to, to make the adjustment. Right. Spring training. 1983, you know, <laughs> for a kid trying to get acclimated right. and going away from his friends and stuff, being able to go to some spring training parks was outstanding. First pitch to Michael, it's a fastball that misses up for ball one. So Boston, New York, now where does that put you? Miami? Uh, yeah, Mets fan. Definitely. Atlanta? Hardcore Mets fan. Mets fan, sure. yeah. okay. 1-0 pitch, that one's taken for a strike one, nice off-speed pitch. Only New York team that I really stayed connected to okay. after I left. Now, did you follow hockey a lot before 
I the followed, Predators. You know, the, the miracle on ice would have been, uh, and, and the Islanders winning four straight, that would have happened while I was a kid. 1-1, one, one, lifted high and deep to right center field. Tawa going back towards the triangle, looking up, and that one is gone. Two-run shot, Davis Michael cutting the lead. Now 3-2, to two, Newport on top. And this is an Upper Valley team that came in with only eight home runs on the season, last in the NECBL. They now have their ninth. And just fighting right back into this one. Well, I think that was an off-speed pitch, maybe a change-up in Michael. You could tell with the crack of the bat right there. He got it right on the sweet spot, lifted it. And again, this park is a, a good hitter's park, but I, I don't think he needed much help. No, I, I don't think it would have mattered. You know, it juts <laughs> into about 315 there in right center, but it probably could have cleared the 395 as Matt Tarabek takes ball one high. And you know, something interesting, we saw Horchansky struggle in his first appearance back in the last inning. And he's a D2 guy pitching to a lineup full of D1 guys. And Michael with the homer right there, he's a D3 guy facing off against Bates, a D1 guy. So, Will, question for you is, how does that compare D3 to D1? How do the levels compare with each other? I think that's what's great about these summer college leagues is you get a chance to play against great competition. And, and really, if uh, you're a late bloomer, 1-0 pitch, fastball high for ball two. Or if you just weren't a guy that was recruited very, very much, you get a chance to play against guys. And a lot of things even out over the course of a three- or four-year college career. And honestly, you can kind of rise up to the level of competition that you're playing with. That one's taken for strike one in the outside corner. Newport has Wesleyan University's Mike McCaffrey, and you know, he's looked solid his past couple of outings, playing in the NESCAC Division Three. led the NESCAC in strikeouts this past year. Swing and a miss from Tara back to even things up at two and two, but you can also play with a chip on your shoulder. No question, I, I do think the, the, the guys from D3 really get excited to show that they can compete. I watch, uh, a lot of youth baseball too in the Nashville area and there's a lot of stuff that goes on. Break even offering curveball this one, rope to left field, but O'Regan is there to make the catch for out number one here in the second. You know what happens a lot is the, the top level division one teams will identify kids in the ninth or tenth grade and sometimes they're committed by the end of their sophomore season in high school, but there's a whole other level of players that maybe get passed over on that initial run, but by the time they're a junior or a senior they're very capable of playing college ball and sometimes they slip through the cracks and that's where some of the lower level D1, D2, D3 teams can really get some good players. First pitch to Bowen is a fastball taken for strike one and low and outside corner. And yeah, you're right there. Also, it's the case in the NECBL. You may have teams that take a lot of the, the guys who are from big schools that may have not played that much. That one is lined towards the third baseman, Gonzalez. He's able to stab it for out number two. Nice play there from the Commodore. Pretty good reaction there. It was sort of a curving, hooking back towards him. That ball was mashed though. And a uh, nice reaction there by Gonzalez over there at third. But you know, it gives a lot of the maybe D1 players who go to huge schools, come to a league like this. Yes, they're gonna be a lot, but how about the guys that are not really playing that much at those D1 schools? It gives them an opportunity to play a lot of baseball, get a lot of reps. Zach Hogeson is one that stands out, and Cole Austin, who is one of the best hitters on this team, he couldn't play due to transferring rules, but really it gives you a nice opportunity as Midori takes ball one high, as opposed to some of the guys who are maybe playing every day and don't necessarily get as excited about it as those guys with the chip on their shoulder. Yeah, I, I think another thing that happens, let's take Gonzalez as an example. He's a premier recruit, and he was still fighting for his job, and he got to play a lot of the time, probably two-thirds of the games I think he started, but, uh, you know, he was fighting to keep his job because they had other guys. That Vanderbilt is recruiting guys from all over the country, and sometimes you can get squeezed out. Uh, Eater is a good example of the, the pitcher. You know, he didn't pitch a whole lot, but he's a guy that's very talented, as you've seen. Right. And he's going to be fighting to, to get innings next year. But that's how those top, top teams who are trying to win national championships and get to Omaha, they stack it up. But not everybody can play. It's so, sometimes the lower you go, it ends up being a, a better experience for you because you're playing every day. You're not, you're not really looking over your shoulder. If you go over four, you come out of the lineup kind of thing. They're going to stick with you. Quick meeting on the mound for Kevin Winterode and Josh Bates. Now, as your father-in-law, coach of Dartmouth, ex-coach of Dartmouth, you have some perspective here as the 2-0 pitch runs well inside for ball three. How much do you think college coaches pay attention to or take into consideration how well a person's doing 
during their summer season to kind of give them more of an opportunity when the spring comes around? I think, uh, I think it's important. I, I think developing is, is so crucial. I think uh, each year that you're in the college game, you have to get better because, you know, obviously college coaches are looking for the next wave. They're always trying to bring in good kids every year. And so there's probably a certain amount of seniority. There's a certain amount of – a lot of coaches want to give the upperclassmen a chance. But if you're, not, if you're not getting better, if you're not producing, and if you're not uh, developing – they're going to try to find that next guy below you. Right. Everyone is put pressure on always, so you consistently have to go out there and show that you are able to compete. That's one of the great things about this league. The first pitch to Chris Berry is taken for strike one on the outside corner. Berry singled in the first inning. 3-2 to two, Newport on top, but Upper Valley has scored two off the two-run shot by Davis Michael. One on, two outs. Bates working from the stretch. Fastball misses high, now one ball and one strike. And it's kind of funny that you bring up the topic of coaches paying attention to how their players are doing in summer ball because the guy at the plate right now, Chris Berry, has been asking us all about his stats and how to get them exactly right. I think there was a missed <laughs> stat a couple games ago that he wanted to get. He was like, oh, my coach is going to kill me. He needs to get my stats right. And, you know, you see that from Berry. And then another guy like Feliz that I've heard him say that his coach hasn't even asked him about his stats at all. So that's kind of weird to see a guy getting asked a lot about his stats and a guy on the same team not getting asked so much about it. Two well, one pitch it, foul down the left field line. And of course the coach can't see everybody every night. I know Tim Corbin, the Vanderbilt coach, who sends a couple of players to the goals every year, always tries to come around once a summer to see all of his players. He's usually got a few guys in the Cape Cod League. A lot of times the guys from this league will graduate up into the Cape Cod League the following year and of course it gives him an excuse to come up here he right, grew up exactly. in this area so he left so I know he really does pay attention to how all of his players are doing 2-2 two, two fouled into the netting down the third baseline what did you say is the biggest thing that separates a D1 player that doesn't get that much playing time compared to one of the top guys in Division 3 is it just that opportunity is it just you know some guys are committing way sooner and then those great D3 D2 players are developing a little later I think it, it definitely varies, but I think it certainly can be that. 2-2, two -two curveball in there for strike three. Barry goes down looking on the inside hook, and Bates is able to end the inning, but Upper Valley scores two off the two-run shot by Davis Michael. They leave one runner on, no air for the goals. We'll head to the bottom of the second inning. 3-2 to two Newport right here on the NECBL Broadcast Network. As we welcome you back here to historic Cardines Field, Dave Peck alongside Dan Stein and the voice of the Nashville Predators, Will Donick, here inside the broadcast booth. Game two between the Nighthawks and the Gulls. Newport won the first one by a score of four to two. Tyler Madison picked up the win. Now on top, three to two. We've seen a couple of long balls already in this game and we have a pitching change here, but not necessarily for performance. Yeah, uh, coming into this game, manager Jason Sparsky told me that Danny Orchansi was going to have a 30-pitch limit tonight, his first start of the NECBL season. So they're going to limit him tonight, and you know, even more so that he struggled in the first inning. But he gives away to Ty Adcock, who has a 4.05 ERA in seven games, all in relief. Six and two-thirds innings pitched, eight strikeouts, eight walks, and five hits in his last outing at Plymouth the other night in a 7-4 loss. He pitched one inning and gave up two hits with a walk and a strikeout. And he can throw some heat. He's been gunned at Elon at 97. Elon versus Elon here as Liam O'Regan digs in and swings at the first pitch, fouled into the netting down the first baseline for strike one. So these are college teammates going head-to-head -head here? Going head-to-head. -head. Uh, about this? We do see that a lot. Also, we do see sometimes that college coaches go against their own players as this pitch will come in, I'll let you get this one. <laughs> Adcock comes to the set, sets the glove at the belt, leg kick, here's the 0-1, breaking ball swung over for strike two. Ooh, that was an exploding slider right there. <laughs> yeah, so finishing my thought here, our <laughs> pitching coach, Tom Hudon, the starter for the Blue Sox the other day is actually from Merrimack. Tom Hudon is the pitching coach at Merrimack and they scratched him just before the game. 0-2 pitch, another breaking ball, that one fought off down the third baseline. Well, remains 0-2. So I guess the Blue Sox thinking that, oh, man, they must have a great scout on this guy. 
because he does share a pitching coach with the Nighthawks, <laughs> and they scratched him from the start there. It's a Belichick-esque move. <laughs> you know, you pick up James Harrison as soon as he's released. I don't know if that did anything. The teams know each other quite well. Adcock from the stretch with nobody on. 0-2 pitch. Swung on and missed for strike three. First K of the ball game for Adcock, and there's one gone in the second. Well, that fastball was as advertised right there. He just blew it right by him, set it up with a couple of good breaking balls, and then just peppered the outside corner with the heat. And O'Regan is a guy who definitely struggles hitting the off speed. That's his ninth strike out of the season, but a lot of them, especially against the Ocean State Waves, a couple of times they're just able to mess with his tempo and keep him off balance. Nice put away pitch there from Adcock. Here is Tim Tawa, let off the game with a double. Back in the first inning as he takes a first pitch low and outside for ball one. And Adcock is also a guy that at Elon hits and pitches. So how often do we see that at the college level? How often do we see a baseball and basketball player as 1-0 pitch misses just slow, now 2-0. It is less and less <laughs> you know, if, if for guys that get a chance. And this is maybe another thing that you have the opportunity to do in Division Three or Division Two right. that is harder and harder to do at the at the major college level because there are so many good players and they do want you to specialize. And Tim Tao is a guy who was the Gatorade Player of the Year in football for three years. As that one misses just outside, now 3-0. He was the Gatorade Player of the Year in Oregon in baseball just in 2017, but he was one of the best athletes in the country out of West Lynn High School, quarterback there. And he chose, he had to make the decision to play baseball. Not a bad one, baseball at Stanford. 3-0 pitch, misses low, ball four. And that, that is something that I know a lot of college baseball coaches, I definitely know that Tim Corbin looks at this. He wants guys who play more than one sport. Not that they're gonna do that at the college level, but he likes guys who are multi-sport athletes that continue to play basketball or another sport to balance things out because it's, it's, uh, I, I think it's really good for your development. A lot of times you get pulled into that travel ball schedule. As right. as the further south you go, you can probably play year-round, but it may not be the best thing for you in your development. Here's Zach Britton. That's from the left side. RBI singles first time up. Is that one is taken for strike one, a low and outside corner. But, yeah, you know, a lot of the culture around baseball and a lot of sports, really, like you mentioned, AAU programs popping up, travel baseball, do you necessarily agree with that? Is it, can it work for some people? Like, where do you find the balance between continuing to play sports? There's always the risk of injury for football if you really care about something else. It, it's, uh, there's pluses and minuses with the way that things have gone. I think you have to have coaches that are flexible. I think uh, depending on which two sports you're playing or which three sports you might be playing, but there, there probably becomes a time when you get 14 or 15 that you at least have one that you emphasize more than another. Here's the 1-1 one, one pitch. This one softly flared towards the second baseman, Hardison, who drops it and then tags second. And it wouldn't really have mattered. There's one runner on, so there's no chance for the double play. But that'll go down in the book as a four unassisted. <laughs> well, he tried the old trick of intentionally dropping the ball to try to get the double play, which... The umpire deemed that he intentionally did it, and so he waved off the double play. But I, if he'd have maybe backed up a couple of steps and let that ball bounce, he might have gotten away with that. Well, it depends on how much Britton was running down first base, <laughs> and they're going to say that he was out anyways because Tawa's still on first, and Britton is retired for out number one as they check on Tawa. But, yeah, if you, know, if you see with runners on first and second and it's you know an in-between infield five play like that, yes, you – Maybe have the opportunity to get away with one, but with one runner on, you see Britton kind of dogging it down the first baseline. That's when you have an opportunity to try and double him up. Tau is off on the play, and Bowen can't get it out of his glove. So he's up on second. Newport running a lot in this doubleheader. You know, you like sometimes you see a pitcher have the awareness to let the ball drop and turn the double play. You don't have as much time to think about it, but that's a good baseball play. Second base, you have a little more time to decide, but the umpire is also watching you close, especially on a ball like that. That was right. up in the air for a good while. That's not easy to, to fake <laughs> right there. <laughs> right. You have a lot of time to think about it, so maybe you can see you thinking, you can see you scheming over there. One ball and no strikes here to Hosey. Had that two-run shot in the first inning. I want second, two out, three to two lead to Newport. First pitch, or second pitch rather, misses low for ball two. 
I think this may be the most well-attended game that Newport has had this season. Christmas in July, an interesting concept, but it's been successful the past two years. Here's the 2-0 pitch. That one misses low. Now three balls and no strikes. It really is a great crowd here tonight, so I can't take credit, right? I thought maybe, <laughs> but the Christmas in July, that explains it. You know, they had a feeling. They knew some, you know, some big-time broadcasters would be here in the booth with us, and that's, you know. But honestly, maybe that may deter people because they'll want to listen in at home. 3-0 pitch, nice breaking ball, catches the outside corner for strike one. Yeah, and the Christmas in July thing is, I think kind of, I mean, it's my first year in the NECBL, but I've heard that's kind of a tradition in this league. Every team, I think, does it. We do it. I don't think we've had it yet, though. Uh, we also do a Halloween night, so all the holidays coming into play here in the NACBL. <laughs> Red Sox night was last week. We had Bill Spaceman Lee in the broadcast booth with us. Well, that must have been a treat. That was certainly an experience. 3-1 <laughs> jerks the curveball low for ball four. So Hosey is on, extends the inning. Runners on first and second. Still two down. Newport still with a 3-2 advantage here in the bottom of the second inning. I'm old enough to have watched Bill Space Spaceman Lee pitch. And one of my favorite books, of uh, baseball books, is his book. If you ever re read the, the Wrong Stuff. Space Odyssey or something? That was one of them. Yeah, something his first like one that. I think was called The Wrong Stuff. Okay. And it, it'll make you laugh out loud <laughs> for sure. Here's Stevie Mangrum grounded out the hardest in that second his first time up. Hadcock working from the stretch. Long pause. Takes a look at Tawa a few times. Now goes to the plate with it and misses low and outside for ball one. I mean, he was talking a lot because actually my partner in the booth was Mike Lord, the play-by-play -play guy for the Valley Blue Sox. And Mike, he's been in the league for 16 years. He's way older than all the other broadcasters, probably <laughs> around 50. I'm not going to, you know, try and guess too much or pry, but he was able to have a really nice conversation because they came from the same era. So they're talking about the oh, 75 man. World Series. They're talking about what could have been in the mid-years of the 70s. Mangrum lifts this one foul down the right field line for strike one. But I'm just sitting there kind of listening back and forth. They're talking about bottom of the third inning of game three of the World Series when Spaceman spiked the curveball and it was, you know, a close <laughs> play at second. And I'm just sitting there, you know. Well, nodding my head about the 75 World Series, especially around here for all Red Sox fans, they can probably recite almost every inning right. of every game because right. it was such a classic. You had the Carlton Fisk home run. Made its appearance in Goodwill Hunting, even in pop culture. 1-1 one, one curveball, this one inside out swing, lined into the right center gap. It'll get all the way to the fence. Coming around to score is Tawa. Stevie Mangrum trying to make it a double. He will as the throw gets all the way behind Kirian at third. Now Hosey scoring from third. And two runs are across. Newport now leads it 5-2. to two. And Mangrum is safe at second. So again, a throw that missed the cutoff and Newport able to take advantage of it. Well, there was certainly a lot on that throw. It just wasn't near the target. Mangrum did the right thing by hustling to second. That's a double all the way for sure, although in this park, you really have to do, ha you have to have some wheels, but the throw misses the cutoff man by a good distance, even though there's not a whole lot of foul territory down the third base line, the runner scored easily. And really fortunate, actually, I mean, ended up not being fortunate, but they had a chance with the throw because the fence juts way in here at Cardine, so Melendez could field it relatively quickly. First pitch to Gonzalez is in there for strike one. You also take advantage of the fact that the, the pitcher correctly is, is backing up home plate in anticipation maybe of a play at home. And so there was nobody backing up third. Well, the thir yeah, the throw was, I mean, <laughs> halfway <laughs> down. Equal, yeah, you didn't know if it was the home or the third. It was basically halfway down the third base line. Regardless, it's 5-2 to two now. Newport on top, still two down. The 0-1 curveball just misses off the plate. Now one ball and one strike to Gonzalez. He's singled. His first time up last inning. And that's unfortunate to see for the Nighthawks' defensive mistakes that actually cost them a few losses in their seven-game stretch where they are 1-6 and six currently. Here's the 1-1 one pitch. Fastball well outside. Now two balls in one strike. Especially against Valley a couple weeks ago, they had a 3-0 lead coming into their first game against Valley, and they gave it up with two errors in the top of the ninth at home to lose that one and a couple errors when they visited Valley later that week and lost that one 8-3. to three. Upper Valley, though, all things considered, 971 fielding percentage, second in the league. 
19 errors, that is second as well. Here's the 2-1, waved and missed for strike two. Newport had a bizarre game in that 8-6 loss to the Bay Sox. Six unearned runs, six errors, really uncharacteristic of Newport, but that puts them at a team ninth ranked fielding percentage of 956, also 30 errors to account for. Yeah, a early enough in the season, a couple, of, a couple of bad games can skew those stats. Right, it, there's not a lot to go off. <laughs> they can change very quickly. Here's a break-even pitch, and it's waved to miss on the curveball in the dirt for strike three, but Newport is able to get two more off the double by Stevie Mangrum and extend their lead to five to two. Will, thank you so much for coming in. Enjoy, I'll let you enjoy the rest of the game with your son. So happy to have you in Newport, and so glad you could come on the broadcast with us. It was really special. Well, it has really been a blast. I love getting there and calling some baseball. It's really near and dear to my heart. Very different than calling a hockey game where you have a chance to maybe <laughs> have a conversation during the game. That does not happen. <laughs> yeah, a little, a little going faster on. pace. Well, <laughs> yeah, baseball is where you start. I mean, you were doing Vanderbilt baseball for a little bit. I did. I got a chance to do some Vanderbilt games uh, after I graduated. I actually unofficially did a few in the in the dugout when I was playing and not uh, in the lineup. So I do love calling baseball, but it's been a pleasure hanging with you guys. Enjoy the rest of the game. Yeah, thank you so much. Take care. <laughs> right. Newport on top, 5-2 to two, as we head to the top of the third inning right here on the NECBL Broadcast Network.